Good afternoon, and welcome to today's call, One Week Out, The Legal Landscape of Election 2020. I am Lindsay Langholz, Director of Policy and Program at ACS. As many of you know, ACS is a diverse nationwide network of lawyers, law students, judges, scholars, and many others who are committed to upholding the U.S. Constitution in the 21st century by working to ensure that the law is a force for improving people's lives. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. First, please note that today's call is being recorded and the recording will be available on our website, acslaw.org. Second, if you would like to ask a question at any time during the call, please type it into the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. We will be taking questions after our presenters are finished with their remarks and we'll try to address as many as possible. If you are a member of the media, please include your outlet with your question. One hour of California CLE credit is available for this call. Please email us with the legal landscape of election 2020 in the subject line at info at acslaw.org to receive your certificate. If you are seeking CLE credit in a jurisdiction other than California, please consult the rules of California. CLE materials can be found on the event page on the ACS website and will be shared with all participants in a follow-up email. Finally, ACS is a nonpartisan 501c3 organization. Our conversation today will focus on questions of the voting process, but we won't be getting into support or opposition of any political party or candidate for elective public office. Now, the 2020 election cycle has been like any other in our modern history, um, from a primary season that coincided with the arrival of a global pandemic, to voting methods that are being utilized for the first time in many states, to a Supreme Court that has been issuing last minute election decisions through its shadow docket and a newly installed Justice Amy Comey Barrett, uncertainty and some anxiety hangs over this final week of voting. Thankfully, we have a fantastic panel of experts to help us explain the legal contours of this final week and what we can be expecting after the polls close on November 3rd. To lead us through this discussion, we have Jonathan Meza Stein, Executive Director of California Common Cause. A civil rights attorney and longtime democracy reform advocate, Jonathan became the Executive Director of California Common Cause this year in May. Jonathan previously spent four years as the head of the Voting Rights and Census Program at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, Asian Law Caucus, where he worked to increase access to California's democracy for historically disenfranchised communities, including immigrant and limited English speaking voters, communities of color, low income communities, and people with disabilities. He's been in the voting rights space for a long time, so I won't go through his whole bio. We have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm gonna turn over the mic to him. Jonathan, please take it away. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, California Common Cause is an organization, the state chapter of Common Cause. We're dedicated to building a California democracy that includes everyone. We work on voting rights, redistricting reform, and money and politics reform to end structural inequities in our state and local democracies, and among other things, to end the severe voter participation disparities on the basis of race that persist in California's electorate. We live in uncertain and unprecedented time uh, for voting rights. According to the Stanford MIT Healthy Elections Project, more than 300 lawsuits have been filed in 44 states about voting rights and the administration of America's elections. Those lawsuits touch on every topic under the voting rights sun, from access to vote by mail, to availability of ballot drop boxes, to naked ballots, to curbside voting, to signature mismatch rules, on vote by mail ballot envelopes, and on and on and on. Several of those cases are already pending before the Supreme Court, which as of last night, as Lindsay noted, has a new justice. That justice, Justice Barrett, likely will preside over post-election disputes over election administration and the counting of ballots. The barriers and voter suppression laws that these want are just one of several fronts in the fight for free and fair access to the ballot. Simultaneous to that, voters must navigate massive disinformation coming out of a variety of sources. First and foremost, the White House, where for months the message has been vote by mail can't be trusted and counting ballots after election day is a sign of malfeasance and fraud. Side note, it's actually the opposite. A sign, it's a sign that elections officials are doing everything they can to count every eligible vote. A long vote count in many cases is a feature, not a bug, 
of a healthy democracy. And then lastly, voters who vote in person must navigate the situation on the ground. There are already long lines to contend with. There is the virus, there are problems in language and disability access, poll workers who won't follow the law, and the possibility of self-deputized election vigilantes who seek to police slash intimidate voters. As an example of the sort of things that happen on the ground, just this past weekend, one of our staff, mem staff members at California Comitas stopped by an early voting site in Los Angeles County and found six police cars parked at the entrance. We called the county and the squad cars were moved within minutes, but how many quote unquote small situations like that will go unaddressed across the country? But despite all these challenges, we have to acknowledge people are voting. Per Professor Michael McDonald at the University of Florida, who is a must follow on Twitter, as of last night, 65 million Americans have already cast their ballot. It remains to be seen whether this enormous wave of early voting, which is setting records in many states, is the beginning of a massive turnout in the general election, or simply it represents a shift away from election day voting to early voting because voters have already made up their mind in this presidential race and don't feel voting in person on election day is safe. To talk about all of this and to talk about what lies ahead, particularly in the courts, we have three esteemed panelists today. Dean Daniel Takaji is the Fred W. and V. Miller Dean and Professor of Law at the University of Wisconsin Law School. From 2003 to just this year, Dean Takaji served as Associate Dean for Faculty and Professor of Constitutional Law at the Ohio State's Moritz College of Law. Dean Takaji's scholarship focuses on the law of elections and democracy. He has published over 50 law review articles, book chapters, and other scholarly papers. His most recent work, Voter Registration in a Pandemic, was published in the University of Chicago Law Review Online this year. Kat Calvin is the founder and executive director of Spread the Vote and the co-founder and CEO of the Project ID Action Fund. A lawyer, activist, and social entrepreneur, Kat has built a national organization that helps Americans obtain the IDs they need for jobs, for housing, and for life, and going to the polls. She is the co-host of a podcast called Vote the Podcast. Jonathan Diaz is legal counsel at Campaign Legal Center, where his work barriers to accessing the ballot, including issues related to local election administration, the intersection of elections and the criminal justice system, and census. He litigates voting rights cases in federal courts around the United States and advocates for laws and policies to expand access to the ballot. Jonathan also represents CLC on the Advisory Council of All Voting is Local, a national campaign that works with partners at the state and local levels to ensure that access to the ballot is expanded and protected. The panel today will engage in a 30 minute conversation, give or take, and we'll hold 20 minutes for question and answers at the end. All right, let's jump in. Dean Takaji, let me start with you. How will the challenges that voters have faced in registering to vote and voting by mail affect the election and potentially give rise to post-election litigation? Well, thank you so much, first of all, Jonathan, for that wonderful introduction and for moderating this panel. Thanks to Lindsay and ACS for organizing it. Um, and it's a privilege to be on such a distinguished panel. Um, so. We've heard a lot about the problems that people have been having and the uncertainty regarding the rules for mail voting, um, absentee voting as it is referred to generally. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that's important to recognize about absentee voting is that there are a lot of things that can go wrong with it and sometimes do, right? Most of the absentee ballots that are sent out to, requested and then sent out to voters are returned and, and uh, are, are able to be counted, but there are always some that aren't. And there are things that can go wrong, like questions about whether the signature mass matches, whether the uh, ballot was properly returned, the naked ballot issue, for example, whether it, they arrived on time. Um, and then the other issue you mentioned, voter registration. This is a less um, talked about issue in this election cycle, but I think it could actually wind up being even more important. The usual means by which people not only register 
to vote, and, but also update their registration, have not been fully open in this election cycle. That includes interactions at the DMV office. It also includes face-to-face -face interactions, say, in supermarket parking lots and other places where we usually have people canvassing to vote. And a lot of people every election cycle use these face-to-face -face opportunities to not only register, but also update their information. But not in this election cycle, at least we've seen a lot less of that face-to-face -face activity. So what are the likely consequences of this, especially if we have a state that's close, either in the presidential election or lower down elections? Well, the big two things that parties and candidates can fight over after an election ballots and provisional ballots. So uh, if it's close enough, and close enough, well, it depends on the state, but, you know, it could be that we have a state that's pretty sizable, like Pennsylvania or Wisconsin, say, where the candidates are actually separated by, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of votes, or over 100,000 votes at least. But we still have enough questions regarding absentee ballots or provisional ballots that the there's not certainty yet about who the winner will be. And so absentee ballots, we know about those disputes. In fact, we've already had, well, over 300 cases related to the pandemic, many of which involve absentee ballots. And in a close race, we're likely to see more such litigation. Provisional ballots, when people don't show up on the registration rolls, or at least aren't on the registration list for the place where they show up to vote, um, what will happen outside of election day registration states like Wisconsin um, is that people will generally cast provisional ballots. Um, and there can often be disputes over whether those provisional ballots should be counted. So I think the long and the short of it is because of the issues surrounding the large number of absentee ballots that will be cast, we already know in this election, much larger than usual, as well as potential disputes regarding provisional ballots, many if not most of which have to do with registration issues, it kind of increases the possibility for post-election litigation and um, sort of increases the margin at which an election might be subject to litigation and ultimately resolved in federal or state courts. Thank you for that, Dean Takaji. I, I think that one thing some of us will remember is that Bush v. Gore election in 2000, in which um, there were uh, representatives from both major parties packing vote counting rooms. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers the Brooks Brothers riot of 2000, which was, um, that, that's a real deep cut uh, for those of you who were hardcore election nerds 20 years ago. Um, but it, it will be the case that I think because of the counting of vote-by-mail ballots and the counting of provisional ballots, we have people trying to watch the counting of ballots like hawks and attempting to disqualify votes. And so we're going to have fights in the courts and we're going to have fights, uh, you know, figurative fights um, in county elections offices all over the country. Uh, Kat, I, I want to turn to you next. Um, people are already voting. Uh, tons and tons, millions and millions of, of Americans are already voting. What are voters experiencing on the ground? And how has early vote gone in your experience? And what are you keeping an eye out for, for election day? Uh, first of all, I deeply appreciate your Brooks Brothers riot cut. Um, actually, as of a few minutes ago, 68, 68 and a half million people voting, which is just wild beyond belief. Um, and I think that, you know, there are a few things that we're seeing that are very, very obvious, right? I mean, the first thing is wild lines everywhere. You know, we already have had lines up to eight hours or more. I'm all over the country, you know, we're in like rural North Carolina getting pictures of people who are in line for hours. I, you know, I already have people who are staying out to 1 a.m., et cetera. Uh, and so the, the enthusiasm for early voting um, is extraordinary. That, of course, also 
uh, is a result of a lack of polling places. There's no reason for us to have these lines. We could easily just have enough polling places or have enough early voting or, uh, you know, uh, send ballots to everyone um, as they've done in some states or whatever. So it, it's definitely a form of suppression. But I'm um, also, I think the, the numbers that we're seeing are so unprecedented um, that I'm really loath to blame boards of elections too much I'm because they're working incredibly hard and they're underfunded. And who knew that Alamance County, North Carolina would have lines for four hours to vote you know, three weeks before the election. So it's really exciting. We're also seeing, you know, the numbers, uh, like the numbers of young voters who are turning out are extraordinary. And even if you look, you know, places like Texas that are seeing sort of 100% uh, more young people already voting, I do agree with you that it will be interesting for us to see whether the numbers that we usually see on election day are just transitioning to early voting, particularly because you do have so many states that have expanded early voting. Um, and because, you know, a good 40 something million of those 68 and a half million votes are also mail-in ballots, uh, which have of course been expanded for COVID. So we'll see what it looks like on election day. Um, but given the fact that it's 2020, the fact that this, this election, uh, both the presidential election but also, you know, the, the, the so many states and local elections and even some special elections have gotten so much attention um, and are uh, so critical. And I think that the conversation over the last several years uh, has been so hyper-focused on this election um, that it does really look like we're going to see uh, turn out like we probably have not seen since, you know, the 60s, back when we used to get, you know, turn out in the 60s percent, 65 percent. I'm, you know, but we're also seeing certainly some shenanigans, you know, you mentioned the cop cars. I, uh, you know, we've uh, had, you know, cases reported to us of different types of intimidation around the country. You know, I live here in Los Angeles County where we have both had a ballot box get lit on fire in a black neighborhood in California, as well as the uh, California Republican Party put fake ballot boxes all over I'm um, our county and others, and I think are still refusing to remove them. I'm in different types of um, both latent and subtle intimidation. Uh, we, like many of your organizations, were part of uh, trying to recruit poll workers around the country and have been getting reports from people saying, I tried really hard to be a poll worker in my city where we have these incredibly long lines and was rejected and told that they don't need anybody. Um, and so I think that we're seeing a lot of the, the traditional voter suppression that we always see. You know, the Supreme Court has not been helpful uh, this year um, and has approved suppressive laws um, around the country. You know, I'm most recently telling Alabama they don't have to have curbside voting and I'm, you know, not forcing California or Texas to allow absentee vote, voting for anyone under 65. You know, like we've seen states make decisions. Uh, you know, I work on voter ID law and uh, we have been in a case for since March where DMVs have either been closed or they've been uh, appointment only and we have you know some states where we can't get appointments for next year to get IDs but we don't have a single state that has waived their voter ID law um, or made it in any way easier to vote even though there are people who just legitimately can't get an ID in time for the election because DMVs aren't taking appointments. And so uh, we're seeing a lot of state level and local level suppression or continuation of uh, suppressive laws uh, with no regard for, uh, for the pandemic, for the situation. Um, and you know, I think lastly too, we are seeing a lot of confusion and getting so many questions because there's so many lawsuits that are just changing the rules of voting in states in the middle of voting. You know, and so we've got folks who are early voting and I'm, um, you know, the rules are one way, for instance, uh, Alabama again, where they were giving anybody who uh, was at high risk for COVID a way to waive the requirement to get witness signatures for their absentee ballots. And then all of a sudden, the Supreme Court agreed, well, no, you actually don't need to give them waivers. And so now there's this real confusion because, well, we already have all these people who voted with a waiver are they going to be allowed to vote again? You know, what's the HISTA story? And that, I think we're seeing at unprecedented levels. We've seen, um, you know, people uh, in North Carolina, which actually did something incredible, uh, where, you know, we were seeing incredibly high numbers of 
particularly black voters voting with absentee ballots who were not getting the signature requirements, again, another state that requires witness signatures. And uh, so those ballots should have been discarded. And then North Carolina made a really extraordinary last minute decision to give everybody who didn't get a witness signature a new ballot so that they could do it again and get the signature, um, which was you know incredible, uh, but not a thing that we're seeing all over. So a lot of, of the things that we're seeing and the sort of questions and concerns we're getting are, I don't know state because these lawsuits are changing the rules so frequently um, and it's made a lot of people afraid to vote by mail in a time when that's what we need people to do um, and so for your question for what what we're going to see on election day i honestly think we're probably going to see incredibly long lines i think that the this early voter turnout is not a sign of everybody shifting from election day to early voting i think that we've just got so much enthusiasm and so many numbers and so many people who are who are still wary of voting by mail that we're going to see an absolutely monster election day and i i i think that the numbers are pointing towards uh voter turnout numbers like we haven't seen in a very long time thanks kat and if for anyone out there who is watching sort of the the long election day lines that cat see that cat mentioned or other election day shenanigans um you want to call 866 our vote to reach the national um, election protection hotline. Um, you know, to follow up on Kat's point about the, the overwhelming early vote and what it might mean for turnout, in California, we have an a election data guru named Paul Mitchell, and his observation is that in, or in past elections, the people who voted early were people who, this is his line, know where their stamps are, homeowners, um, uh, older voters, right? Um, people who, uh, you, if you know anything about the demographics of um, uh, voting patterns, uh, those are Republican voters. And Democratic voters were the ones who voted later um, and often had their votes counted after election day. What we're seeing in the early vote totals in California is those numbers are shifting. And, and in fact, it flipped. Um, the, the, the early votes are predominantly Democrats. Um, and but what does that mean, right? Kat, you, you speculated as to whether, does this mean that things are just shifting? Does it mean that sort of the culture among Democrats right now is, you know, you have this sort of team spirit attitude. It's like, be safe, vote early, uh, and it's sort of aligned with this idea that we wear masks, we keep the community safe, whatever. Um, whereas, you know, is it the case that Republicans are simply hearing from uh, decision makers and opinion makers in their um, universe that you don't use early? don't use vote by mail. Um, these are things that we can't totally predict, but uh, Kat, I think you're right that regardless of those dynamics, we're gonna see massive turnout on election day. Um, I want to um, I want to turn, oh, I wanna first, I wanna note for everybody, please ask questions in the Q&A um, and uh, we'll moderate a um, question and answer session here in, in just a bit. Um, Jonathan, uh, let me bring you into the conversation. Thank you so much for waiting patiently. Uh, as counsel at Campaign Legal Center, um, share for us more about the litigation landscape. Um, how are the ongoing lawsuits that, that have been mentioned several times already going to impact the administration of this election? And could it even out, uh, impact outcomes? Yeah, so I mean, I think as, as several folks have mentioned already, um, this has been one of, if not the most uh, heavy election cycles, certainly in recent memory. Um, and, you know, much of that litigation has centered around absentee and mail voting. Um, you know, earlier this year, um, litigation was really focused on who could vote absentee, trying to expand eligibility for no excuse absentee, um, and things like that. Um, as the year continued, it shifted into, you know, how do you vote absentee, um, litigation around things like witness signature requirements, which we've mentioned already, um, and sort of the technical requirements of how to cast a ballot and make sure that it's counted. Um, and what we're seeing now, um, sort of on the tail end of the pre-election day litigation, is uh, our cases about, you know, when you can vote absentee and when those ballots are going to be counted. Um, there have been, up until just last night, there were three sort of big potential blockbuster election cases uh, sitting at the Supreme Court waiting for decisions out of Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Wisconsin, all of which have to do with when does your absentee ballot need to be back in the hands of election officials in order for it to be counted. Um, all three of those states had, uh, you know, extensions of one form or another that pushed that deadline past election day. 
um, but they all took slightly different forms. So in Pennsylvania, it's the state Supreme Court interpreting the state constitution to extend that deadline. In North Carolina, it's a decision by the state board of elections that you know, is the regulatory authority for elections in that state. And in Wisconsin, it was a federal district court that changed that deadline. Um, and so in the Supreme Court's decision in the Wisconsin case last night, uh, declining to, to let that deadline stand, uh, the extension stand rather, um, you can see in the varying opinions from Chief Justice Roberts, from Justice Kavanaugh, from Justice Gorsuch and Justice Kagan, um, all of them sort of trying to parse those different states and the way that those extensions are being made. Um, and, you know, reading the tea leaves of those, of those various concurrences and dissents can be a little challenging um, because we don't know how they are going to apply the reasoning from this Wisconsin case to, you know, the North Carolina decision that's pending. Um, and, you know, they have already heard the Pennsylvania case, but it's back. Um, and we don't know how Justice Barrett is going to alter uh, that calculus. Um, so, you know, those are the cases that are currently pending at the Supreme Court, but that's not where all the action is. Um, there are still cases going on at the federal district court level, in state courts, at federal appellate courts. Um, there's a lot of litigation going on about poll watchers and poll monitors. Um, you know, who is permitted to go into the polling place and observe um, not just the casting of ballots, but the processing and canvassing and counting of ballots. And are they permitted to challenge ballots as potentially invalid? Um, there are currently cases in Pennsylvania and Nevada um, along those lines. Um, and, you know, we've already seen attempts um, by, you know, the parties and candidates, um, particularly by the president's campaign in Nevada, to try and stop counting of ballots that have already been submitted um, while they, uh, you know, while they hash out all of the, the ongoing litigation disputes. Um, you know, that request was rejected by the district court in Nevada. Um, but I think it's a preview of what's to come after the election if, you know, as is possible, um, the election is quite close and there are still a number of, uh, you know, absentee and mail ballots still to be counted. Um, I think that we are likely to see uh, litigation from, probably from the campaigns, um, to try and, you know, stop the counts um, or exclude certain late arriving mail ballots, um, particularly in states where there have been changes to the deadlines, um, you know, in order to affect the outcomes one way or another. Um, you know, in the entire history of this country, there has been one presidential election where the outcome was potentially determined by a judicial decision, and that was, you know, Bush v. Gore already, already referenced earlier um, in 2000. Um, so, you know, I don't want to scare everyone and say that the chances of this happening are high because a lot of things need to go, you know, the, in a certain direction for, for the Supreme Court to even have a case that could determine the outcome of the presidential election. It has to be within a certain margin. There have to be a certain number of uncounted votes remaining that could affect the outcome. Um, and there have to be legitimate claims about whether or not those, uh, you know, those ballots can, can or should be counted. Um, I think that the, some of the opinions um, issued in the Wisconsin decision yesterday are a little alarming, um, particularly Justice Kavanaugh's concurrence suggesting that state Supreme Courts and state constitutions, um, you know, can't bind state legislatures when it comes to legislating and regulating elections. Um, you know, I, the Supreme Court, as, as uh, you know, Dean Takaji and, and Kat alluded to, um, has not been very active in defending the right to vote this cycle. Um, and, you know, the rest of the federal court system taking their lead has been very hesitant uh, to, you know, intercede to expand uh, protections for voters. Um, you know, they largely have deferred to state election officials and state legislatures who have declined to do so despite the global pandemic. Um, so, you know, it is alarming to see a court that was already pretty hostile to voting rights claims, um, you know, become even more so this year. Yeah, Dean Takaji. Yeah, let me jump in in response to Jonathan's comment, which very nicely um, highlights some of the big things that 
we should still be looking out for in this election cycle. And two big points here. First, it's not just that the current Supreme Court majority has not been a friend to the right to vote, but in fact, that court has issued many decisions now over the last several years that reverse lower court injunctions, lower federal court injunctions protecting the right to vote. Um, they have, in other words, stood in the way of court orders that were protecting the right to vote, relying on a case from several years ago out of Arizona, Purcell versus Gonzalez. Um, you sometimes heard about, you hear about the Purcell principle, which is really a misnomer because it's not actually a principle. It is, properly speaking, a factor in the analysis that in general, uh, injunctions issued by a federal court close to an election can sometimes be disruptive, and that's it. But in the hands of the current Supreme Court majority, it's become almost this ironclad rule that federal courts may not issue injunctions protecting the right to vote close to an election. And it is a profoundly anti voting rights principle or rule that the Supreme Court majority seems to be applying. The effect of which has been to push a lot of these disputes that should really be in federal court into state courts. Now, this brings me to the second issue, which is the one that presents the biggest possibility for Supreme Court resolution uh, with the newest Supreme court justice potentially being the deciding vote. Uh, and this has been teed up over the past week. And I think the likelihood of litigation has really increased over the past week, by which I mean litigation that could be resolved in the Supreme Court with the decisions out of Pennsylvania and my state, uh, Wisconsin, last night's decision. And here's the issue. Um, may state courts rely on their state constitutions in cases involving federal elections? Or alternatively, does that violate either Article I, Section 4, or Article II, Section 1 of the Constitution? Now, at first glance, that may seem crazy. Like, how could a state court be violating the federal constitution by relying on the state constitution? Well, the, the argument is that both Article I and Article II refer to the state legislature as the entity that at least in the first instance to make rules governing federal elections and so the argument goes and this was an argument that had been accepted by well at least some version of it by some of the concurring justices in bush versus gore um, state constitution makers are not the state legislature and so it would violate the u.s constitution for state courts to rely on state constitutional law in cases involving federal elections. Um, it's very clear there are three judges, three justices, three Democratic appointees who disagree. It's also pretty clear that there are at least two justices, maybe as many as three on the current court, who think that it is a violation of Article 2 for state courts to rely on their own state constitutions in federal election cases. Um, and so the question is, well, the, the chief does, has given signals that he doesn't agree, which is a good thing. And we'll see where our newest justice stands on that question if the issue ever gets litigated. It's likely to get litigated at some point. And actually, the Supreme Court rejected a version of this argument a few years ago in another case out of Arizona. But it's it's very, very worrisome if the Supreme Court starts, starts superintending not only federal court orders protecting the right to vote, but now state court orders protecting the right to vote. So let's, let's go straight to the... Uh, Justice Barrett question. Um, you know, uh, Dean Takaji, you, you teed this up nicely. Um, what, if anything, do we know about her history on voting rights and what does her elevation to the Supreme Court last night mean uh, in individual cases or in a more expansive sense for um, legal disputes over the administration of this election? Uh, who wants to start? Um, I, can, I can start off. I mean, I don't think that we know, you know, too much about 
um, you know, Justice Barrett's views on the right to vote in particular. She was not uh, not very forthcoming in her confirmation hearing when asked about these issues by by several of the senators. Um, you know, demurring on a lot of these questions. You know, because uh, it might implicate you know a case that she that she might hear, um, and you know, which is a pretty standard response uh, for judicial confirmations nowadays. Um, but I mean, I think given her her writings and uh, you know her you know brief history on the Seventh Circuit as as a pretty conservative judge, um, I think it's fair to assume that voting rights claims, which were already facing a pretty steep climb in the Supreme Court as previously constituted, um, have become you know even less likely to succeed. Um, you know already. Um, in the Supreme Court, you know, with the solid, you know, 5-4 conservative majority, um, you would have, you know, one of the conservative justices to join the four liberals, um, you know, to, to win a voting rights case, um, whether it was the chief um, or, you know, Justice Gorsuch or Kavanaugh or whoever it might be. Um, but now, you know, even in, you know, as, as Dean Takaji mentioned, you know, the chief justice doesn't seem to be, you know, particularly inclined to buy this, uh, this argument that's being made about state constitutions and state courts. Um, that's not going to be enough, uh, you know, to stop a claim like that from succeeding at the Supreme Court unless someone else joins him. And that doesn't seem particularly likely. Um, I guess, I mean, it's possible that, that Justice Barrett could, could surprise, um, but I would be it would be quite a surprise uh, in in my view. I think that it's, uh, you know, for a court that was already, as I said, pretty hostile to voting rights claims, um, it's it's not gotten better. Um, and, you know, the, I think the absence of, of Justice Ginsburg in particular, um, who, you know, was, you know, off, quite eloquent, often in dissent in, in these kinds of cases, you know, Shelby County in particular, um, is going to be felt um, for quite a while. Right. If you don't know uh, Justice Ginsburg's quote about uh, uh, um, throwing out your umbrella in the dissent in Shelby County, go Google it now. Um, Dean Takaji or Kat, do you want to weigh in? I'll just weigh in briefly, since it's always better if we have at least a little bit of disagreement to push back a bit on the idea that we know uh, or can even predict with any degree of reliability beyond speculation how Justice Barrett will vote on this big looming issue about Article 1 and Section 2 and whether state courts can rely on their own state constitutions in federal election cases. I just don't think we know. In, in my view, Justice Kavanaugh um, and Justice Gorsuch, it's, at least seems to be with him, have gone really far out on a limb in saying that state courts should not be relying on their state constitutions in cases involving federal elections. I mean, this was a theory that it seems to me was pretty decisively rejected by a majority of the Supreme Court in Arizona State Legislature versus Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission a couple of years ago. Um, it would be incredibly disruptive to state courts' administration of their elections. Um, and, and let's remember, most of the law that exists governing elections is state law, with a thin overlay of federal law at the top, but it's mostly state law. It would be incredibly disruptive if a majority of the court were to go down the road that Justice Kavanaugh suggests in his opinion last night. Uh, and, and, you know, let's remember also Justice Kavanaugh was a part of the Bush legal team, um, at least reportedly, <laughs> back in 2000. Um, so he, he may have views on this issue from that, but I don't, I, I certainly would not expect, although it's quite possible, that Justice Barrett would go down this extreme road based on what we know about her so far. And, and if she were to do so, it would certainly look like she's, uh, well, uh, in light of the bruising confirmation battle she, she's just had, um, that she is something less than a completely neutral arbiter. Let me put it that way. 
Sure. And I, I don't want to suggest that, you know, we have any reason to believe based on her previous rulings or, or anything like that, that we know how she would vote on any of these cases, because as far as I know, she didn't really, um, you know, have the opportunity to rule on a voting rights case during her time in the Seventh Circuit. And, and I doubt she's given much thought to this specific issue, to right. be honest. But I will point out that I, I'm pretty sure that she was also on the Bush v. Gore legal team uh, with Justice yep. and Chief Justice Roberts. But, so who knows? But I, I, I think it's really important that we that we acknowledge just how far out on a limb this theory that's been floated by Justice Kavanaugh is. Certainly. Uh, gentlemen, let me make space for Kat to jump in here. You know, for me, the biggest takeaway from what has happened with the Supreme Court is that it's more important than ever for a Congress to pass a new Voting Rights Act. Uh, I think it's very clear that we that the Supreme Court right now is on an anti-voting rights bent. Um, and so we've got HR1 in the House that has been passed. It is by no means perfect, but it is something. Uh, and we will see what happens um, next week uh, with the election. But the thing that is very, very clear to me is how important it's going to be for us to pass a new Voting Rights Act and how really critical it's going to be for us to remind people that they've got to pay attention to who their Secretary of State is, that they have to pay attention to their local boards of elections, because uh, we need to start really thinking about what we're doing about voting on the ground well before it gets to the Supreme Court. God willing, we have a John Lewis Voting Rights Reauthorization Act of 2021 or something similar. Um, okay, a question from our audience. Um, does this administration have any realistic post-election litigation route that doesn't depend on close margins? Um, that is to say, disputing the count of provisional ballots or vote by mail ballots when those ballots might be the difference uh, in determining who, which presidential candidate wins a uh, state. Can Trump sue to stop election counts entirely um, or anything of that kind? I guess I, I think the, the only realistic route that I see in, in, for, for I, you know, either candidate if they're behind, honestly, uh, in, in the court is if there's a close election, right? I, I just, those are when you have post-election disputes. And, you know, if you look at the polls, it doesn't look like it's that close right now. But it seems to me there's a lot more uncertainty in the polls than is usually the case, because this is such a different election. Remember, when, when pollsters um, give you their results, it's based in part on predictions about who's likely to show up on election day. And, you know, in general, those predictions are reasonably reliable from one presidential election to the next. This is a really different election. And so who are the voters who are going to be afraid to show up on Election Day, even if they might have told someone when responding to a poll that they were planning to vote on Election Day? It, it might be that there's... Uh, that who actually winds up showing up turns out to be different because we know um, fear of the pandemic, of being out in public, uh, is not exactly um, the same among Democratic and Republicans generally. Um, Republicans are, in general, um, <laughs> less fearful of being out there. Um, you can go to some parts of my state of Wisconsin and see where the numbers are especially high, there is a strong political valence to that. Of course, it's not all Republican voters, nor is it all Democratic voters who are more concerned about being out there. But I just, I, I think that there is a possibility. I don't, I wouldn't put odds on it, but there's certainly a possibility that this could be a closer election than it's looking to be from the polls right now. And those are the situations where we're likely to see some sort of a post-election litigation. Another question from the audience. Um, uh, and if anyone wants to jump in uh, on that one, please uh, speak up now. What can be done to protect voters from um, voting vigilantes or uh, are even armed quasi-militias um, who uh, seek in some way to intimidate voters? Um, and the question here is, do we have adequate law enforcement to manage 
uh, those sorts of situations. But I also want to throw out the possibility that for many communities, law enforcement is not the right solution to those situations. Um, and in fact, raises as many new questions as it answers. And so um, thoughts from the panel on uh, how we handle that um, very difficult uh, 2020 dynamic. You know, I, I have, yeah, oh. go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, uh, why doesn't Jonathan go first and then Kat? Sure. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think the first step in dealing with things like, like voter intimidation and harassment is just knowing, you know, what the rules are in your particular state or jurisdiction. Um, voter intimidation is illegal under federal law, but I think every state has some additional version of, you know, the a voter intimidation or harassment statute. Um, and in most of them, in the first instance, um, it's poll workers and precinct captains and the election workers themselves um, who are, you know, empowered to deal with those kinds of things. Um, so it can be just reported directly to the people working the polls. Um, you know, in, in certain instances, when, you know, the threat of violence uh, appears imminent, that's when law enforcement, you know, gets involved. Um, as Jonathan said, um, you know, that's not always going to be the right solution, you know, in a particular community, um, and in, in some cases could make things worse. Um, but, you know, I think it's important to remember that in the 2018 midterms, there were similar, you know, pronouncements made about, you know, sending waves of armed poll watchers, you know, to the polls in mass, um, and, you know, that all turned out to be bluster and never really materialized, um, you know, isolated incidents aside, we didn't see the kind of, you know, widespread marshalling of, uh, you know, voter intimidation squads that some people feared. Um, and so, you know, I think that it's important not to let that bluster discourage participation in this election, um, because if it doesn't end up materializing, but it still scares people away from the polls, then it still worked. Um, and I think that, you know, I'm sure that Kat has, has more to add about, you know, what to do actually at the polls if, if you encounter it. Um, but I'll just say that, you know, on our website at campaignlegal.org, we have posted materials um, for, I think we're up to seven states now on what the voter intimidation and harassment rules are um, in places like Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Michigan. Um, so, you know, we've made that publicly available, and I know that there are similar resources, um, you know, floating around the internet as well. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that and, and sort of point out and sort of emphasize one thing that Jonathan said is that we don't usually see violence. Um, you know, one thing that we've already seen uh, in Virginia, so this is the first year that Virginia has had no excuse early voting. Uh, which was very upsetting and very confusing to a group of Virginians. And so when Virginia started voting, actually several weeks ago, we did have situations where there were anti-early voting protesters who were blocking polling places and blocking people, you know, trying to block the doors and stop people from voting. Uh, first of all, it was nonviolent. It was mostly annoying and a little sad, but it was nonviolent. There were no weapons and it was handled. Um, and I think that, you know, if we're likely to see much distraction or disturbance beyond that. And I actually haven't heard of a lot of that happening. Virginia was a very special case because it's the first time that they've had no excuse early voting. So it was just this, you know, very sort of strange, terrifying thing to some people. Um, but we haven't seen a lot of violence or intimidation yet. Um, and we've been voting, you know, in some states for a month now. Um, I think that a couple of things are helpful. This is actually one place where very long lines are helpful. You know, when there are hundreds of people outside, it's much less likely that someone's going to come and be really annoying. There's a lot of news coverage at the polls. You know, a, a lot of organizations like mine are at polling places where there are long lines, handing out food and PPE, et cetera. However, they're also trained in what to do when there's a problem in election protection, et cetera. Um, you know, 866 hour vote is a number that I practically have tattooed on my forehead. It's the Lawyers Committee's election protection number. It's extraordinary. They're in all 50 states. They are 
operational 24 seven during elections. Anytime anyone has a problem, you know, you can call them, you can text them, you can go to 866rvote.org um, and report it and they've got folks who can help. Uh, and, you know, there are, you know, just similar sort of local groups, you know, Fair Fight's doing a lot of things. Uh, the NAACP is doing a lot, of, like, a lot of things. There are a lot of local groups out there. So I think that the, the violence, uh, issue and sort of threats are exactly like Jonathan said, a thing that are meant to stop people from going in the first place. Um, they, we haven't seen, you know, when I was doing election protection in, in Las Vegas in 2016, even we had all these threats and occasionally people would drive by in a truck with some guns, but they just drive by and keep going. I'm, you know, we haven't seen anything real yet. Could it happen? Absolutely, we still got a week of voting and things are getting more and more tense. Um, but so far, the intimidation we've seen has been pretty light. Um, and then I think I will be the third person to emphasize that law enforcement is not the answer. Uh, law enforcement in many of our communities will only make things worse. Um, and frequently in our communities are, um, are not there to protect us, or at least we don't feel that way. And so um, if there is a problem at the polls, unless it does escalate to violence or to something where you, do, you are forced to call law enforcement, my first answer is to call 866 our vote um and frequently if things are are bad enough they'll even send lawyers who can then help you know deal with law enforcement i'm um, but you know in this country having adequate law enforcement is never the problem we've got adequate law enforcement for anything it's <laughs> what that law enforcement is being used for uh, but so far i think that most of the efforts and, and this is even when you look at things like foreign interference etc they're not doing anything at the polls they are trying to stop people from going to the polls in the first place and so the way that we discuss this will determine whether or not we help scare people or whether we let them know these are, this is just blustered. This is just meant to scare you because they don't want you to show up and you can show up and be fine. Let me just add one quick point. Um, I very much hope we don't see instances of violence or intimidation or threats at the polling place. We were worried about this four years ago. It didn't really happen, at least in those, any significant scale. But Tensions are even higher now than they were four years ago, so it's not beyond the realm of possibility. Uh, if there are any election lawyers or pro-democracy election lawyers out there, I guess I would be ready with TRO papers to file if there are issues of voter intimidation on the polls and be ready to go into court to stop those as soon as they happen. I think that is a remedy that uh, lawyers who care about protecting the right to vote, uh, whether they're with the parties or with nonprofit groups, should be readying themselves to bring. Uh, an excellent point. In California, for example, we'll have California Common Cause will have poll monitors in 1,200 voting sites across Southern California. Asian Law Caucus will have poll monitors in 800 voting sites across Northern California. And we're both partnering with the ACLU, which has TROs drafted already in the event that we need them. Um, uh, last question from the, the audience. If SCOTUS holds that state constitutions cannot govern federal elections, should we expect states to fence off federal elections um, as separate from state elections so that their state and local elections would be completely governed by state law? And if so, is that a good thing or a bad thing for democracy? So that already, ha that already happens in some places. Um, you know, in Arizona, for example, some voters receive federal only ballots. Um, you know, it's, it's not super common. Um, it doesn't happen in many jurisdictions, um, but it has happened before. Um, so I wouldn't be, you know, completely shocked to see some states going in that direction if that were the case. Um, I, you know, this is, a, this is a, a hypothetical on top of a hypothetical. So it's hard, it's hard to really think about how that would impact election administration. My guess, um, and this is purely speculation, is that it would um, not be viewed positively by election administrators because it would effectively double the amount of work that they'd have to do. Um, and in most jurisdictions, election administrators are already under-resourced and underfunded and scrambling uh, to, you know, meet the needs that they already have to. Um, and so I think that that would, you know, it's, that would be a case of trying to solve one problem and potentially creating, you know, dozens more. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and going back to several years ago, like 25 or more years ago now, right after Motor Voter was enacted in, in 1993, there were a few states that actually tried 
to administer separate voting voter registration lists. I believe that Mississippi was one of them, if mem memory serves. But it became unadministrable, and they gave that up. I mean, they were trying to get out of the requirements of the NVRA for, for their state elections, and it was just a, a lot more difficulty than it was worth. Uh, it's, but it is another reason why I really hope the Supreme Court does not go down this road. And, and I think in the meantime, because there's a lot of uncertainty about what the majority on the Supreme Court will do, the best course for state courts is try as much as they can to avoid relying on the state constitution and simply rely on state statutes uh, when and if election disputes come before them. Um, and that's exactly what the Pennsylvania court just did a few days ago and in, in steering clear of any state constitutional issues as a way of at least trying to avoid Supreme Court review. And I would, you know, I would just go in, Virginia does this. Virginia has elections every year because they have federal elections and then on their off years, they have their state election. I, it's, it's a little exhausting if you work in voting rights, but honestly, there are people in Virginia get fired up about elections every year. We see a lot of activity and a lot of action. So it, this obviously would be disastrous on a lot of levels, but as far as the sort of good or bad for democracy and elections, I think that there is most certainly a way where we can increase the number of elections in a state and have them be separated by state and federal and see people who are still enthusiastic, who are still active, uh, who still go out and vote. I'm, you know, I live in California where we've got so much on our ballot that sometimes I do wish we could split it up anyways. Uh, so it, it, it would not by any means, I think, be, you know, sort of the end of democracy or mean that people would stop voting uh, because we see this in Virginia. Uh, so while, yeah, it's obviously we hope that this that's going to skews one way, not the other. Uh, I do have some hope in knowing that there are states where they separate the elections and everything works just fine. No, I push back on that. I think it's kind of a mess for, especially if you're trying to run elections with a limited staff, if you're trying to administer two separate sets of rules for federal and state elections, which are often happening at the same time. Yeah, Kat, your optimism is, is admirable. I think there's probably elections officials out there who are screaming in horror at your suggestion that we could, we could do that. Um, I, uh, I want to thank all of our esteemed panel members and ACS for um, uh, making this happen today uh, and, and to all of our audience for um, joining us uh, this close to the election. Um, I want to note, uh, if you're not on elections Twitter, get on there. That's where this conversation is continuing for the rest of um, election season. In ACS is at ACS Law. Um, uh, Jonathan is at JMDSJD. Jonathan, your header photo on Twitter is the same one I had for years, um, which is uh, like a stunning similarity to Jonathan's work in lockstep, I guess. Kat is at Calvin LA. Dean Takaji is at Dean Takaji. And I'm at underscore Jonathan Stein. Um, as you try to navigate um, this, the remainder of this election season, uh, I, I want to leave you with this. Uh, you are watching an ACS panel, uh, which means that you know how to vote um, and you know how to navigate election systems. But uh, this is a year in which democracy takes every single one of us. And so I would ask you to go to your friends, your family members, and your community members, those of whom are least likely to know how to vote, and make that extra effort to ask them if they're registered to vote, if they've checked their voter registration status, if they know how they're going to vote. Because so much is changing in every state. You have to do more homework in 2020 to get your vote right than in any previous election. So ask people, have you made your plan to vote? Are you voting early? When are you voting early? Are you voting in person? Are you doing it during, doing it during the early vote period? Where are you doing it? Uh, for a lot of folks, the standard process of walking around the corner to the schoolhouse or the fire station is no longer possible because either COVID prevents them from doing it or because that election site has been eliminated and consolidated with others. And so you probably don't have any difficulty doing your elections homework in 2020, but there are members of your community who absolutely will. Um, and so reach a handout and make sure that you're a democracy warrior um, in this last uh, one week, good heavens, um, before election day. Uh, and with that, I just wanna thank our panelists one more time. Uh, we appreciate you so much. And I wanna thank Lindsay and ACS for making this happen. Thanks so much, everyone, and happy voting. <laughs>